with all microphones of any budget level and any topology, whether it's a dynamic microphone, whether it's a condenser microphone, there's no such thing as a good sounding or a bad sounding microphone. You gotta do away with that mindset. There is only a microphone that sounds good on what you're recording and a microphone that doesn't sound so good on what you're recording. Welcome to After Hours. My name is Gregory Scott. Tonight, I'd like to do something a little bit different and turn the forum over to you, the viewer. I'm gonna start checking the comment section specifically for questions that are interesting. So if you watch this show and you get a question in your brain, drop it in the comments. I've always read all the comments, but uh, I'm gonna start throwing some segments out there where we just address interesting questions. Tonight, I wanna read a question from CS. CS says, I feel like the SM58 is more forgiving on my singing voice than a condenser mic. Can anyone explain why? This is one of my favorite questions and topics. I love microphones. I love talking about singing and vocals because that's one of the things that I do in my musical project, Sneaky Little Devil. I'd like to give you a little backstory on why I prefer dynamic microphones on my voice and my lady's voice in our music. Specifically, we've decided that this little thing here, the Electro Voice 635A, is our mic of choice. And we do that, interestingly, even though we have this creature right here. This, see that right there? Ooh, this is the Josephson C716. This is a phenomenal microphone. This $4,000 microphone. It's $85 on eBay. This is the one we end up going with. And there's several reasons for that. First of all, I just want to say, this microphone is extraordinary. If you're doing anything where you want the recording to sound like the singer, not a recording of the singer, not a colored version of the singer, not a flattering or a euphonic version, but just that's the sound of that person's voice. The Josephson, it's hard to beat the sound of that microphone. The downside of the Josephson in every microphone of its ilk, whether it's a cheap Marshall condenser microphone or a super expensive vintage C12 or U47, is that they pick up everything. I mean, everything, right? If you like, right there, they pick that up. You're hearing a, a condenser microphone right now that's about 18 inches from my mouth. It doesn't sound like it's 18 inches away. These microphones are incredibly sensitive, so they're detailed. They have that nuance and they capture all this beautiful personality and whatnot. And there's a lot to be said for that. At the same time, if your room is less than ideal, they're going to pick that up. And so you have to get closer to the microphone to mitigate that. And then you start getting that sort of muddy proximity effect. Back to our friend, the EV635A here. There's, there's really nothing special about this microphone in any sense. I'm not, I don't advise that you all run out to eBay and try to find this microphone because I've tried it on a lot of singers and on most of them, it sounds like garbage. It's an interesting microphone because this is an omnidynamic. Right? So most dynamics, almost all dynamic microphones are cardioid or hypercardioid. So they, they have a very specific lobe pattern that they pick up and they kind of reject or give an off-axis presentation of what's behind the microphone. This creature here picks up everything 360 degrees kind of evenly. There's no weird off-axis resonances or whatnot. A cool thing about Omni microphones is that they don't have nearly as much proximity effect as cardioid microphones. So this little dynamic microphone, you can get it right here, right? This is, this is kind of where we hold it when we sing. And it doesn't have that huge, boomy, boxy sound that you generally get when you hold a microphone that close. Dynamic microphones are also less sensitive than condensers. So it doesn't pick up much of the room around. You can have a crappy sounding room. This thing doesn't care. So the interesting thing about that is that if it's not picking up much of the room, you can take your headphones off, turn your speakers at a, a modest volume and sing along to the music in the room. And if you're like me and you're like Sarah, what you're gonna find is that you're probably a better singer than you think. Because for, for reasons I can't even begin to explain, headphones cause a lot of singers to go off pitch. We can't really hear our voice accurately when it's 
isolated. We're used to hearing our voice acoustically in the room. But as soon as you put headphones on, you close that off. You muffle that out. Then you start to hear an imbalance of the resonances inside your body and inside your face. And then you're singing into this microphone. And it's coming through the wires and back in through these headphones. So you're hearing a weird, amplified, modified, recorded version of your voice. For whatever reason, that throws my brain off. And I know I've recorded a lot of singers and a lot of other singers report this too. Pitch problems occur with headphones. The beautiful thing about singing into a dynamic microphone with your headphones off with the speakers in the room is you need a lot less auto-tune afterwards. Maybe you won't even need any. There's that. And then one more thing about Sneaky Little Devil in my workflow here, and then I'll get on to CS's question. What we found is that because we were picking this thing up to do our scratch tracks, because you don't have to set up a headphone with the cue mixes and the different balances for me and Sarah and all that stuff. We're just picking this up and we're laying down a vocal. And we're like, does this lyric work? Is this harmony cool or interesting? And then we would get the answer. And if the answer was yes, we were finding like, oh, you know what? This, this actually sounds pretty good. What's going to just add a little bit of 4K maybe because it's a little bit dull on the dull side. Dynamic microphones usually need a little sparkle added or whatnot. And then I'd find that when I would distort and compress this microphone, it was way more interesting sounding than when I would distort and compress the Josephson, which had a just, it just kind of got kind of crunchy and nasty. And I was like, hmm, interesting. So dynamic microphones, in my experience on voices, they have a more interesting texture. They have these weird sort of EQ curves built in. And then when you distort and saturate and compress those things, those textures become even more interesting. There's a grainy quality to them. If you listen to Sneaky Little Devil, you'll hear it right away. You'll be like, there's there's something to the, the texture of those voices that's not normal. It's not typical, I'll say. And since everybody in the entire free world right now seems to be doing their vocals through condenser microphones because they've gotten so affordable, uh, this is another way to sort of make your sound a little bit different than everybody else's. So that's my rant on this microphone and dynamic microphones in general. As to CS's question of why the SM58 is more forgiving on his voice versus a condenser microphone, this is a broader question and a really valuable kind of wisdom for you to take away from this show right now is that with all microphones of any budget level and any topology, whether it's a dynamic microphone, whether it's a condenser microphone, whether it's a ribbon microphone, which is technically a dynamic microphone, but it's a, it's a different creature, they have a different sound. There's no such thing as a good sounding or a bad sounding microphone. You gotta do away with that mindset. There is only a microphone that sounds good on what you're recording and a microphone that doesn't sound so good on what you're recording. So if you have five microphones and you're a vocalist and you haven't tried all five of those microphones on your voice, doing yourself a disservice. Tracking engineers, professional tracking engineers, they usually have access to a large mic locker and they know their microphones inside and out. So they know when I'm recording a female vocalist, I'm gonna pull these five out and we're gonna shoot them out and everything. Cause even then, especially with the human voice, you never know what microphone is gonna win a shootout. So try different microphones out. Never rule a microphone out based on budget and certainly never rule anything out. A microphone, an EQ, anything on the basis of its internet reputation because i don't have to tell you internet well freaking crazy people with a bunch of ideas and a lot of they don't know what the frick they're talking about and at the end of the day even if it's true for most people that a certain microphone or a certain piece of gear isn't that good or doesn't work or doesn't have that sound or whatever until you use it on your stuff in your room the way that you hear music you just don't know so take everything with a grain of salt including this guy right here. Don't believe or trust anything I'm saying other than using it as a basis for your own inquiry. That's going to be one of the running themes of this show as we record episodes through the years, hopefully, because I got a lot of episodes planned. And many of those episodes now I'd like to turn over to you with these kinds of questions. So in the comments, drop a question. If you've got one, drop three questions. I don't care. I read all the comments, I really do. But the ones that I think are really interesting to the full audience, I'm gonna pull out and make uh, shows on them. So please, thank you for your participation. Thanks for your support as always, and I'll see you soon.